mm -hmm. a logic teacher. When I was uh, in undergrad, you know, 100 years ago, I had a philosophy logic teacher from Poland, and we had chalkboards, and he had great pants like I had almost every day, and he would go up to the board and he would, but he would smoke during class. And we weren't sure, <laughs> we weren't sure he was smoking the chalk and trying to write with the cigarettes. Oh my it gosh. wasn't American cigarettes. It was, it was something important. It was nasty and it was, it was just one of the worst classes I've ever had. <laughs> so we have, we have V, we have D, and we have J. The V is for variable. The D is for variable. Diversity. And J is for joining. These are what we call gene segments. They are pieces of DNA that only code for part of a protein. And so we're going to have varying numbers of V, varying number of D and J, but we're actually, we're not going to have diversity in the light chain. So we'll have heavy chain, we'll have V, D, and J, the light chain, we'll only have V and J for our purposes. And so if you look at this, the genetic loci up here, we'll, we'll look at the lambda light chain on the top, and you see the red boxes are V gene segments, okay? And what I want you to notice about them is that they have a leader sequence in front of them, that L, a little white box of L. There's actually a promoter. There's a promoter in front of that that allows it to promote for transcription through that gene segment. But it doesn't encode for much, just a segment. So each one of the V gene segments, and it says up to uh, the lambda, up to 30 V gene segments, uh, were, uh, they each have their own promoter. Downstream of them, you see the yellow box, that's a joining segment, joining lambda 1, and it is associated with a constant lambda 1. There's a jo uh, joining lambda 2 and a constant lambda 2. There's actually four sets of those. And so typically J lambda 1 associates with C lambda 1, J lambda 2 with C lambda 2. The kappa light chain below it works a little differently. You have all of the J, the J segments attached together, J kappa 1 through 5. And they're not attached, but they're, they're associated in, in one block there. And you have one constant uh, V genes, uh, constant uh, segment for that. But you have up to 38 V gene segments up stream. So lambda, about 30 Vs, and 4 Js that you can combine. Kappa, about 38 V gene segments that can combine with up to 5 J gene segments. The heavy chain locus is much more complex. About 40 different V gene segments. We're only showing four of them because you, you just can't get them all on. Downstream of that are the diversity gene segments, 23. And downstream of that, six J gene segments. And then, if you look real close, that blue box says C mu. That's the constant region of genes, segments for the mu heavy chain. So this is what dictates that it's going to be an IgM. The first one downstream of that variable part is going to be C mu. And I'll show you what's farther downstream because the next one is delta for IgD. But I, what I, I want you to, to kind of visualize this because what we're going to do is we're going to select one of the red boxes in the heavy chain, one of these, and we're going to rearrange it to one of the Ds. That's the first step that takes place in the immunoglobulin generation. Uh, on the heavy chain, V to a D, rearrange it. Uh, the, the light chain, we're not even going to mess with. It's, it's not even going to start going through the rearrangement process. So, let's move forward. Uh, what's gonna, this is showing you the light chain, but, but just keep in mind, this is what happens later. And it's showing you that you're in a germline situation, and there's a gap in between the V and the J, and we're not, we're not identifying what that V gene segment was. You know, there's about 30 of them, right? And it could be V1, it could be V28. It's one of them. And it could be one of the four J's that were downstream. 
it's going to rearrange that. So all the intervening DNA between that V and that J gene segment is lost. Okay? We are physically cutting the DNA and bringing them together, and we have a VJ for the latch. Yeah. So is this what's happening in affinity maturation like you were telling me or not? It is not. Oh. We're going to get affinity maturation is after we've done that, then we're going to mutate. So this is just to make the first molecules. And unfortunately, I've, I've got the light chain showing up first. It actually happens later in maturation. The first thing that happens is the heavy chain. And so you have two steps going on. Germline DNA at the top. And what you see is the AV, AD, AJ, and then you see four things there, four blue boxes that are the C mu. Those can code those CH1, CH2, CH3, CH4 of the mu heavy chain. And then we've got some other stuff downstream that you know, is involved in. Is it going on the membrane or is it secreted all that stuff? So we have a V gene segment. We're going to choose that one of the 40 V gene segments with its own promoter is going to be rear. Oh, I'm sorry, this is DJ first. I'm that screwed up. Back up. DJ first. So one of the 23 Ds is going to re rearrange with one of the six J's, if I got it right. And all of the DNA in between is lost. So if you think about that, if it was D23 and J1, the only DNA lost is whatever's in between there, and we don't care about it. You still have 22 Ds upstream, and you still have five Js downstream. But if you rearrange D1 to J6, you, you uh, loop out all of the DNA in between, and you have nothing else in there. You just have the, the first D and the last J, they form that DJ. And then the next step would be to bring one of the 40 Vs and rearrange it and loop out everything in between. And we'll, we'll show this in, in a little more uh, substance here as we go through this. Let's see. Uh, this is what I want you to be aware of. Kappa, 38 V gene segments. This is 34, 38. I just need 38. 38 V gene segments, and there are 33, uh, I'm sorry, no diversity, five joining gene segments. Okay? Um, you, that means 38 V's could, re, re, could rearrange with any of the five J's and give you 190. Is it, is it five or four? I can't remember now. I'll have to, have to, uh, these, are the, these are the numbers I can remember. 38 times five equals 190 uh, different <coughs> kappa chains simply by, by rearranging which V segment to which J segment. Remember the life chain is just V and J, no D segment. With lambda, you have about 33 variable and four or five joining, and so I went with I went with 33 and five. That's 165 different lambda light chains that could be produced from the simple random rearrangement of the V's and the J's. Now there are four to five constant gene segments also associated with lambda. Why do they not get uh, included in the calculation? They're constant. They are not going to uh, affect the uh, the antigen binding site at all. They are uh, only involved in the factor function or frame function. So the constant do not affect the antibody or the antigen binding region. Heavy is where it gets a little more going on there. 46 variable, 23 diversity, and six joining. That uh, is going to equal 6,348 different uh, chains potentially. Now you, you have uh, that that number to go along with 190 kappa chains and 165 um, lambda chains, and you, now you've got over two million different antibodies simply by rearranging the, the genes. So we've got a lot of uh, variability that's just encoded in every one of our cells. Okay, every one of your cells has the DNA to make over two million different antibody molecules, but only the B cells do it. So let's talk about why the B cells do it. This is how they go about doing it. And this is where I don't want you to get hung up on the biochemical, probably uh, the, the enzymatic events that are taking place here. I will tell you the things that I think are important to you, but suffice it to say, there's this 12, 23, or 23, 12 rule, and then there are these specific sequences called heptamers and nonomers. 
Heptamer would mean, would mean seven uh, nucleotides long, and it's a specific sequence I'll show you in a minute. Nonomer would be a nine nucleotide long sequence, specific. And th then we have a 23 base space be between them, and, or a 12 base space. And so if we look at the top one, we have the lambda downstream of every one of those, however many V genes there were, 38 one there were, uh, is a nonomer, I'm sorry, heptamer, a 23 base spacer that uh, it doesn't matter what the sequence is, all we know, all you have to worry about is there's 23 bases there, and then a nonomer. That's a recombination signal sequence, an RSS. Upstream of every J is the, what you see there, and that is a, um, right next to the J is a, is a heptamer sequence, a 12 base pair spacer, and, and a, a nonomer sequence. And that is a recombination signal sequence as well. These two, you have to have these 12 and 23 base pair spacers in between these heptamer and nonomers in order for these pieces of DNA to bend around and interact with each other. And I'll show you a picture of that here in a minute so it makes a little more sense. Now, now can anybody think what the significance of 12 and 23 is? Jeez. Jeez. How many turns, how many nucleotides in the turn of a DNA helix? About 11. So this is 12 and 23 is getting you at about one helical turn on one side and two helical turns on the other side. And that's what they think is involved in making sure that the sequences are aligned so that the enzymatic uh, proteins can bind and cause this to work. Now if you look at kappa, the, the, base, pair, uh, the, the base pair spacers are in opposite places. 12 is close to the V, 23 is close to the J. Now look at heavy chain. You've got a 23 base spacer uh, uh, downstream of the V. You have a 23 base spacer upstream uh, of the J. They don't follow the 12-23 rule. So you're not going to have a V re, uh, rearranging to a J. That's why D to J has to go first. You have a 12 base pair upstream and downstream. So the first thing would happen would be the DH7, or the DH that you see right here, would rearrange to this one. The nonomer would come together, the nonomers would come together, the heptamers would come together, and you'd have the base pair spacers looped out a little bit. That would happen first, and then uh, we would cut the DNA, we would bring it back together, and we'd ligate it, and we'd have a rearranged gene sequence. Now, it's not that simple. These are the sequences of these things, just so you get, kind of appreciate another version of it. The heptamer sequences are the same, the nonomer sequences are the same, and then you have 12 and 23 base pair spacers. And, uh, D will re uh, rearrange to J, and D, uh, an upstream D will rearrange to V on the heavy chain, but V do not rearrange to J in the heavy chain. And I don't want you to get into any more detail than that. So the 1223 rule applies to all gene segments. So if you were to look downstream of every one of these V gene segments, you would have a heptamer sequence, some space for the known sequence. If you look upstream of every J, in every D, you would have the uh, appropriate 12 or 23 base pair, and exactly you can see in the heavy chain gene how that works. So the 12, 23 rule applies, and it's important in uh, matching this DNA. Yeah. Is this might be not relevant, but in, so is lambda always 23, then 12, and kappa always 12?